My name is Robbie Luckett. I'm director of the Margaret Walker Center for the Study of the African American Experience at Jackson State University, and I was proud to be one of the organizers of the events today. I welcome all of you here this morning, and I'm going to go ahead and get us started and invite Mr. Malcolm White, director of the Division of Tourism, Mississippi Development Authority, to bring us some uh, comments of welcome. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today to honor a group of courageous pioneers, to reflect on our progress over the last 50 years, and to educate future generations so we dare not repeat the past. One of the most publicized events of the modern civil rights movement was Jackson Woolworth's sit-in, and it serves as a symbol of the enduring spirit of the young men and women who fought in the struggle for equality. The photographs of, Flat, of Fred Blackwell, who's here today, Fred, are recognized as iconic images of an era that captures the passion and emotion of both sides of the movement. Today, exactly 50 years later, we honor the individuals who stayed the course for justice and continued the healing and the reconciliation that defines a new era in Mississippi history. Thank you, Mr. White. And good morning. My name is Ricky Thigpen, and I have the honor of serving as Executive Vice President of the Jackson Convention and Business Bureau. Jackson, Mississippi's 1963 Woolworth sit-in was the most violently attacked and the most publicized in the 1960s. The world was watching Jackson, Mississippi. Today, Jackson celebrates another opportunity and a, for Jackson and Mississippi to mold this great democracy, the United States of America. It's an opportunity for us to show the world that Mississippi has grown and now leads the nation in race, reconciliation, and unity. The world is watching. In fact, today is an example of why we call Jackson, Mississippi, the city of soul. It's because of her people, people who are not afraid to embrace its past and together build the future. So on behalf of the Jackson Convention and Business Bureau's President and CEO, Wanda Wilson, and its board of directors, I welcome you to this hallowed ground and these ceremonies. Thank you. Mr. James Ingram sends his regrets uh, as Chief Investment Officer of the Hertz Investment Group, but I wanted to bring special thanks to them because Hertz is the organization that made this possible and this unveiling on this site possible for all of us to be here today. And so, great thanks to the Hertz Investment Group and Mr. James Ingram. And now I'm going to invite the Honorable David, David Blunt, Senator, Mississippi State Senate District 29. Good morning. On behalf of the state of Mississippi, I want to welcome all of you to Jackson, Mississippi, those of you who live here like I do, those of you who don't live here, those of you who uh, lived here at one time and come back. Uh, we're grateful to all of you. Uh, this program started a couple of years ago through the Department of Tourism at the Mississippi Development Authority. And obviously, uh, it's about tourism. It's about people uh, coming from all across the country to appreciate the history that was made right here in Jackson. But the reason we do this is not just about tourism. Uh, the reason we do this is about remembering our history and hopefully remembering that history so that it informs our present. Yesterday was Memorial Day. We don't simply observe Memorial Day to honor the men and women who have given their lives to this country. We do it to honor the men and women who serve our country today. The same is true uh, with this marker. Uh, it's important to remember that these were ordinary people doing what now appears to be an ordinary thing, uh, having lunch at a lunch counter. Uh, it was not ordinary at all, and the, and the courage required to do what appears to be a simple thing today uh, is really awe-inspiring for those of us 
today. But what I hope folks will realize, whether they live here, whether they come to Jackson from anywhere else in the United States, when they see this marker, is not to think simply about the courage that ordinary people showed 50 years ago, but to think about the courage that needs to be shown today and the challenges that we still face. Obviously, we're proud of the progress that we've made in Mississippi and in this country, but uh, there's more progress to be made, and that progress is made by ordinary people, uh, local people, as the book uh, says, doing ordinary things that require extraordinary commitment and courage. So I hope that in addition to the tourism benefits of this program, uh, that will inspire a new generation of Mississippians and people who visit Mississippi to take up that same commitment. Uh, we're grateful for this program. Uh, I share the program this morning uh, with the House member from this uh, part of Jackson who is not able to be here, Representative Jim Evans. So uh, in his stead, I would like to yield to my colleague from Senate, Senator Hillman Frazier. such a special occasion. Let me start off by commending the organizers of this event for collaborating on such a worthwhile project. The Mississippi Freedom Trail plays a vital role in recognizing the state's civil rights heritage and in commemorating the lives of the men and women who fought for freedom and for justice. The May 28, 1963 sit-in at Woolworths <laughs> is known as one of the most iconic moments in the civil rights movement. So this site is a fitting location for a marker. The sit-ins in this location is part of the cultural legacy that the Mississippi Freedom Trail represents. The marker will not only remind future generations about the difficulties African Americans face, but it will give them insight into Mississippi's civil rights history as a whole. The threats, and attacks the, protest the participants, both black and white, in that historic sit-in on May 28, 1963, had to endure, are a key part of our story about the struggle for equality. And a mark at this location will serve as an outstanding educational attraction that would honor those who contributed so much to the movement. That is very important. It's important because although this country has come a long way in terms of civil rights, there's still much work to be done. And attractions such as this help to inspire young people to continue the journey. It is important that we look back in order to fully understand and appreciate where we are now and where we're going. Our civil rights pioneers envisioned a better life for themselves and their children, and they worked hard and made many sacrifices to ensure that future generations would not face the same obstacles they face. This unique cultural initiative not only offers a glimpse at the people and places that placed a pivotal, played a pivotal role in the fight for justice, but it also recognizes their bravery. The Mississippi Freedom Trail acknowledges our past, but it also serves as a reminder of our thriving present and bright future. And it recognizes the bravery and courage that men and women were a part of, who were a part of the civil rights movement exhibited. Again, I thank the organizers for this cultural initiative, and I 
thank those of you who have come from far and near to help make this event a success. This is a great day for the city of Jackson and a great day for the Mississippi Freedom Trail. Thank you for all your participation here today, and thank you for helping to remember those who fought so hard for so many of us to be where we are today. It's my great pleasure to now introduce to you a true hero of the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi, a man who was the former chaplain of Tougaloo College during the sit-in, and who that day, 50 years ago, was on the phone reporting directly to Medgar Evers about the series of events that were taking place in this location. Reverend Ed King, now with the University of Mississippi Medical Center, the renowned civil rights activist who will bring our invocation. I have a scripture, and I think you will recognize the freedom song related to it. Blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But the law of the Lord is their delight, and in his law he meditates day and night. They shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever they do shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. That's Psalm 1, and to that we added Psalm 62. We shall not be moved, just like a tree standing by the waters, planted by the waters, many verses. In Psalm 62, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is only from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. We remember those who are dead, who are not with us. I think I have the names, but I'd like for us to have this as part of our prayer time. We remember Memphis Norman, George Raymond, Medgar Evers, Dr. Dan Beidle, the president of Tougaloo, and Mrs. Doris Allison, the president of the Jackson NAACP branch, who worked with Medgar to organize the Jackson movement. Let us pray. Lord, help us to know we are never alone. Help us to know you are with us in our courage and you are with us in our fear and despair. Help us to tell others that you can make a change. Help us to be witnesses that change is possible. Help us to be witnesses that none of us is too small to take a step that matters. These things we pray in thy name, amen. I'd like to mention one woman whose name I never knew, who did not follow the song, who was moved, a white woman at the counter from Vicksburg, Mississippi, stayed four or five minutes to finish her coffee wasn't just gutsy. She stayed and then she apologized to Ann Moody. I'm sorry I have to leave. And then she came over to me wanting me to be sure to tell the demonstrators at the counter that she as a Mississippian, white, was so glad it was finally happening and she wished she could stay with them but her husband and her family would suffer too much. That gave me inspiration to keep going through the horror of the next two hours. Thank you. Now to bring introductory remarks is my good friend, civil rights historian, 
and director of the COFO Civil Rights Education Center at Jackson State University, which if you haven't had the opportunity to visit, you should definitely take time out of your day to get over to John R. Lynch Street by the JSU campus to see that. My friend, Dr. Daphne Chamberlain. We're hoping to be arrested and hoping to go to jail. We'll sing and shout and pray for human justice and for human dignity. The fighting may be long and some of us will die, but liberty is costly. And Rome, they say to me, was not built in one day. Good morning. Good morning. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you on this momentous occasion as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the downtown Jackson Woolworth sit-in. And just as a reflection, um, in 1961, before an audience at the state capitol, Governor Ross Barnett made the statement that Mississippi had no problems, but it did. In the spring of 1963, as Medgar Evers and other local black leaders in the civil rights movement made all initiatives to have concessions meetings with the city, Mayor Allen Thompson made the comment that, ah, Jackson, Mississippi, a beautiful city and a wonderful place to live. And it was, and it still is. But there were some things that needed to be changed, and there were some policies that needed to be challenged. So as we sit here today, we not only commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Woolworth sit-in, we must take this opportunity to thank and also celebrate the vision, the perseverance, the strength, and the bravery of people like Joan Trompower Mulholland, thank you, of Ed King, Memphis Norman, Ann Moody, Perlina Lewis, and a number of others who sacrificed so we could be here today to celebrate. But we also want to take this opportunity to celebrate them because it was these young individuals who went before the masses in face of resistance to not only fight for social justice, but also for that freedom and human dignity that I talked about in the poem that I read or that I recited earlier by Margaret Walker Alexander. So again, thank you, and please keep in mind that the fight is not over and that we must continue to celebrate Mississippi's civil rights history. Thank you. Amen. The Margaret Walker Center has been proud to partner with Tougaloo College and other groups to bring on this event today, particularly Tougaloo because it was Tougaloo students, Tougaloo faculty, and Tougaloo staff who are at the heart of this sit-in today. And it's my great pleasure to now introduce to you the president of Tougaloo College, Dr. Beverly Hogan. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, Dr. Luckett. What a pleasure it is to be here and lend the voice of Tougaloo College to this moment in the history of Jackson, Mississippi, the state of Mississippi, and our nation. As I was sitting there listening to everyone's remarks, and when Dr. Chamberlain stepped forward, and I looked back and reflected on Joan and Reuben, and I looked out and I saw Sam Bradford and others of you in this audience, I was reminded of how very proud I am today to be the voice and face of Tougaloo College as generations of men and women have committed themselves to the cause of justice and equality in our nation. Tougaloo College indeed was that institution that prepared and inspired the minds and hearts of young men and women at that time and continues today to use their education to make a difference. Tougaloo College just did not see itself as an academic enterprise institution focusing on the academic preparation of the students, but prepare them to use their expertise, their courage, their the support of an administration to go out into the streets with men like Maker Evers and call attention to the inequality and injustice that was so prevalent in our community at that time. We're proud to be a part with all the brave men and women who really fought 
for justice and equality. During that time, one of the greatest moral movements of the 20th century, the Civil Rights Movement, and the war work counter sit in is certainly one of those pivotal moments that brought about change in this state and in this nation and moved America a little bit closer to being not only a truer democracy, but a more perfect union. So we want to say to you today that we're going to keep on inspiring young men and women at Tougaloo College. We're going to keep on, and the likes of Dr. Beidle and Dr. George Owens, whose shoulders I am so proud to stand on today, because they were the leaders during this time. They were the ones who stood in the gap and encouraged the students and then gave them a safe place to come to, along with other men and women who were escaping the hostile environment of those who oppose change. A lot has changed at Tougaloo College, but I want to tell you today that our commitment to justice, our commitment to using education still as that transforming catalyst to improve upon human conditions and to make this world not only a better place for everyone, but to advance a flourishing world democracy and an economy for all humankind to share in the bounty of God's good earth. So thank you all very much this morning. We salute all of you who have done so much to make this state and this nation and the world what it is today. And the unfinished gender will continue. I'm Reuben Anderson, and 50 years ago today, I was a junior at Tougaloo College, and most of my classmates, John, Sammy, Mendes Norman, and Ann Rudy, had the courage to take on Mississippi. For some reason, uh, I was not that fearless. Uh, but uh, to reflect uh, on what has transpired over 50 years, it occurred to me, why were they on these grounds 50 years ago. And that was a list. Uh, the first was an end to segregated water fountains. The next was courtesy titles for everyone. Black police officers. And served customers on a first come, first come, uh, first serve basis. Today that doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, 50 years ago that was a huge deal. The other thing that jumps out at me about uh, what happened 50 years ago is that all of these were youngsters. None of us were 21 years of age yet. I was 20 years old, and I think everybody else was. We couldn't even vote. You had to be 21 to vote during those years, and hundreds were arrested, high school students. And they were taken to the fairgrounds. They were threatened to take the parks but they kept coming anyway. And young people today, uh, I'm not encouraging you to take the action that they did, but please stand up for your community as you did 50 years ago. And as Beverly said, we owe a special salute to Tupelo College. Everybody whose name I mentioned was housed at Tupelo College. And although they took their lives in their hands. Uh, they changed Mississippi and they changed America. Thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I am not David Hoard. Uh, my name is Eric Stringfellow. I'm the Executive Director of University of Communications at Jackson State University. Uh, so I bring you greetings on behalf of our president, Dr. Carolyn W. Myers. Uh, it's really humbling to be standing here in front of you this morning to commemorate this event and the spirit of what this event represents in terms of uh, Jackson and the state of Mississippi as well as the nation. And how uh, this event as well as uh, a lot of other things that happened uh, 50 years ago. So uh, on behalf of Jackson State, we just want to thank you for coming. Uh, this is something that we really, really support. Uh, we understand the significance, and uh, uh, we're just glad to be here and be, be a part of this, so thank you.
Before I introduce the people who are going to bring our final remarks and have the unveiling of this Freedom Trail marker, there are a few other people I'd like to recognize. First of all, in our attendance today are a number of people who were there 50 years ago and a part of the sit-in uh, in a support fashion or a direct part of the movement, some of whom found themselves uh, arrested that day as well. A number of whom I do see in the audience, um, and I would like to ask to stand up and be recognized. Ms. Margaret Garner, I know is here. <laughs> Ms. Lois Chafee is here. I know that he's been recognized, Mr. Fred Blackwell, who took those wonderful photographs, is here as well. And for the others who I can't see, please raise your hand and now be recognized if you were here that day 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. In addition to their efforts and their activism, I also know in the audience we have a number of other civil rights activists who are here in Mississippi, and I'd like to recognize those veterans of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement who are in attendance now. Please stand, raise your hands if you're a member of the veterans of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Another member of the, of the sit-in movement who joined us all the way from Washington, D.C., is here with us as well. I want to recognize him as well. Thank you so much for coming today. Of course, those activists were supported by family members, and today we're very lucky to have the sister of the late civil rights activist, Mr. George Raymond, and other members of her family who have come uh, to be with us today. And now I'd like to invite Ms. Verna Polk, followed by Reverend Alfonso Lewis, and then Ms. Joan Trumpire Mahalan, who will bring our final remarks and actually unveil our marker for us today. Good morning. Good morning. I am deeply honored and I feel very privileged to have this opportunity to be here this morning. And I would like to thank Dr. Luckett for inviting me and inviting our family to be here to experience this. Today I am truly grateful for this opportunity to be a part of this great gathering, to mark the site where the struggle for freedom took place and to honor and remember the men and women who 50 years ago made a courageous sacrifice in their fight for what they believed in. We are indeed thankful to those who worked so untiringly to make this day happen and to keep the memory alive of the many struggles and sacrifices that were made for the cause of freedom and equality for all. I am proud to speak on behalf of the family of George Raymond Jr., who was one of the young people who 50 years ago made the courageous stand to fight for freedom no matter what the cost. I would like to recognize the family members of George Raymond. I would like for his son, Jomo Kenyatta, to stand. And his older sister, Lois Raymond Blake. His nephews, Robert Blake <coughs> Jr., raise your hand. And his nephew, Samuel Blake. These are both renowned ministers in the city of New Orleans. His, my husband, Henry Polk, and my daughter, Natalie Polk, and his wife, Murtis Raymond Orr. I will thank them for coming, and I want you to know that as a family, we all love him. We all love George and remember him in many ways, as a brother, as a father, a husband, an uncle, and as a friend. We will always have fond memories of him that we will always cherish in our hearts. We did not understand his commitment and dedication to the cause 
of freedom of the struggles he went through and the sacrifices he made. But in knowing George, we knew that he had a great conviction on his life and that he was a man of great faith, not in himself, but in God. He could not have done these things without the love that he had for God and the belief that he had. He believed in doing what he thought was right, no matter what the outcome. As a result of his conviction, he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. He was willing to die for the cause of freedom. The freedom movement have produced many leaders who we know quite well and are so grateful for. But today, we as a family thank you for remembering George and others who have influenced and impacted the lives of many, but never received the accolades that they so, so much deserve. We hope that generations to come will be inspired to continue the legacy of freedom and equality for all. Even though George's life was very short-lived, from what we knew of him, what we read about him, and what others have shared, we know that he lived a life <coughs> to the fullest. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, the quality, not the longevity, of one's life is what is important. We thank you for keeping the memory of our loved one alive. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. We are thankful that we have this opportunity to come and to stand and be a part of this special and memorial occasion. We're the brother of Perlina Lewis. Perlina Lewis was a courageous young lady and she was an inspiration also to the family. 50 years ago, I can remember vividly the day of the sit-in, how she left home in a brand new suit, <coughs> suit that she was wearing for the first time not knowing, we not knowing that she was headed and coming down to this spot to participate in a sit-in. She did not even tell our father. Of course, if she had told him, she may not have made it. <laughs> so she came and we heard it on the news. And when we did pick Perlina up and she came home, the new suit with mustard, ketchup, all kinds of things on it and in her head. She was in good spirits. If she had not been in good spirit, feeling that something special had been accomplished, then all of us probably would have lost it. But because of her determination, because she had the mind to believe that it could be accomplished, it helped all of us. It inspired me to even do more as a teenager and to become more active in the civil rights movement. We're so thankful for this occasion because I know that Perlina is shouting in heaven, knowing that this is being done and is still remembered. I was inspired after the sit-in to become more active and I'm thankful to say that I was one of the participants in the first successful picket on Capitol Street where six of us picket downtown Capitol Street without an arrest. But if it had not been for the boldness and the courageousness of Perlina, I'm sure I would not have been as active as I was. So we are thankful today and our family sends their regards. They could not be here today. My mother, who is 90 years old, uh, wanted us to bring her special regards and thanking everybody who's responsible for this. And we are glad to be able to say because of what they did, this is a better country that we're living in today. They lived in an era that believed if your mind can conceive it mm -hmm. and your heart can believe it, then you 
can, can achieve. achieve. Today, we're not just remembering the students who sat in and what happened at Woolworth. There were nine who sat in. Two names I'll add to the list, Tom Beard and Walter Williams. But also, while we were at the counter, others were in the store supporting us, crucially. Chaplain Ed King, wearing his clerical collar, not only to report back to Medgar, but hoping the collar would help diffuse the situation. Mercedes Wright from the NAACP, also exerting a calming influence. And in the back of the store, James Wells and a few of his buddies, a sort of impromptu security system. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the press, in as much danger as those of us at the counter, because they were the ones who would take the story to the city, to the state, to the country, and to the world. There were as many members of the press as there were people at the counter. First, those with cameras, always the first target, James Thornell. Bob Bullock, who was knocked to the floor, and Fred Blackwell, who had the amazing courage, though he may not have been thinking at the time, to actually stand on the counter to get his iconic shot. How easy it would have been for him to have been grabbed and floored. <coughs> the reporters, with their notebooks in hand, taking the notes and writing the stories. Uh, your own Bill Miner, Ken Toller, Cliff Sessions, Carl Fleming, Doug Shoemaker, Jack Langan. They'll tell you they were just doing their job, but what a job it was. Above all, let us remember Medgar Evers, whose years of work had laid, paved the way for that moment. Much as he wanted to join us, he stayed at his post by his phone in his office. And three weeks later, less than three weeks later, gave his life for the movement he had inspired. Above all, remember Medgar. Just before the unveiling, I realize there are at least two more people that I must recognize before today's events are over. The first is in our attendance, Governor William Winter, who has stood for racial reconciliation and what is right in this state. And we're very proud and honored to have Governor Winter with us today. And finally, I'd also like to recognize the daughter of the late Medgar Evers, Ms. Rena Evers Everett, president of the Medgar and Murley Evers Foundation, who is here today as well, who of course, in a few weeks, we will be recognizing the 50th anniversary, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the assassination of her father, uh, Mr. Medgar Evers, Ms. Rena Evers Everett. A couple of announcements. Please feel free to stay around and take pictures with family and others if you'd like to take pictures with the marker after the unveiling. For those of you who are coming to the luncheon at Tougaloo, we will go straight there to Holmes Hall from here. And we hope all of you will join us tonight at 6 p.m. at Jackson State in the Student Center Theater for the documentary An Ordinary Hero about the life of Joan Trumpauer Mahalan. She'll be there, so we hope you will all join us for that free reception and documentary showing An Ordinary Hero at 6 p.m. tonight in the JSU Student Center Theater. And then tomorrow morning at Tougaloo College, there will be another conversation with Joan Trumpauer Mahalan at 10 a.m. We hope you'll make plans to attend that. And now I'd like to invite Ms. Polk, Reverend Lewis, Ms. Mulholland over here. Please be careful, it's a little treacherous. There are roses planted here, so watch out for the thorns. Oh, 
Oh, you fine. If you can, you can actually get right here. Oh, yeah. You made it. You're right. You fine. here today that the marker is in a temporary location and once the two-way capital street is complete the marker will be moved out to the street for more full viewing thank you very much for being here.